Hello, I'm Dapper Dan Gavazdan, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, which definitely count. And I'm Mischievous Mark Giannacchio, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, but the annuals, for me and my purposes, they don't count. Well, welcome, everybody, to the Amazing Spider Talk, the show where two fans and collectors uncover the strange, fun, fascinating history of the Spider-Man comic universe, whether annuals count or not. Thanks for joining us for this review episode of The Amazing Spider Talk. If you want to swing along with us on our journey through Spidey's past, present, and future, subscribe to Amazing Spider Talk on your favorite podcast app. This podcast exists because of the support of our Patreon members. If you want to receive early episodes, exclusive artwork, and keep this podcast going, go to AmazingSpiderTalk.com and you'll see a big Patreon button That'll guide you to our page where you can consider signing up and joining us. Today on the show, Mark and I are going to be discussing Amazing Spider-Man Volume 6, Number 19. This issue was written by guest writer Joe Kelly. The issue's cover is by John Romita Jr., Marcio Menez, and Scott Hanna. And the interior artwork is by Terry Dodson on pencils and colors and Rachel Dodson on inks. And of course, letters by VC's Joe Caramagna. This issue was first released on February 8th, 2023. Mark, why don't you shoot us your recap of Amazing Spider-Man, Volume 6, and Number 19. Well, Dan, it's worth starting this recap with talking about what may be the most controversial recap page in the history of comics. I guess Marvel has been listening to our recaps and wanted to do one better. Well, you failed, Marvel. You failed. Anyway... Life is almost kind of good for Spider-Man, and it's Terry Dodson art on Black Cat, so let's see some booty, bootyful art, you know, that's totally not (laughs) cheesecake, factory portions, if you know what I mean. Anyway, Spidey and Black Cat are fighting stuff, and Peter is inner monologuing, and after three months of bizarre jokes about demons, I don't mind a bit of it. Felicia and Peter enjoy some hot chocolate, and Cat tells him after all the chaos, you know, that whole... Thing that happened. Take a weekend off at a ski lodge with some silk sheets. So off they go. Felicia driving way too fast with her top down. The car's top, you perverts. Ugh. And we get a cutaway, Family Guy style, to Aunt May telling Peter to wear a raincoat. And now I kind of hate Joe Kelly more than I do Mark Wade from the Brand New Day era when it comes to Aunt May's friskiness. Peter is still in her monologuing, thinking he may have something with Felicia only for... Oh, it's hijinks as MJ and Paul are staying at the exact same ski lodge. What are the odds? Just as I ask that question, Jack Tripper walks into the room to give me the answer and trips over a couch while Chrissy and Janet ask, where has he been all night? Anyway, they are laughing. We are laughing. Peter is wearing kitty kitty boxers and we're definitely laughing. Fortunately, a rumble and a tingle disrupts us from further laughter, and Peter and Felicia are off. The harmonic nature of the earthquake has Spider-Man concerned, so they're investigating. But Felicia is investigating why Peter just can't admit he still has feelings for Mary Jane. Could this be any more sitcom But before we get to that answer, we have White Rabbit and some guys who look like classic Spidey villains, but who are clearly not. One of them is singing Kill the Wabbit, and they say my pop culture references are dated. Oh, wait, they make a meta joke about it, so now I feel weird criticizing it, but hold on. Rabbit then makes a Bazinga joke reference, and now that's double demerits for a reference that's both outdated and from source material that is objectively bad. So the chaos continues until White Rabbit goes Zach Morris on everyone by claiming, time out, but he doesn't, she doesn't inadvertently try to murder or get his best friend arrested due to silly hijinks. So can we even really say this is Zach Morris here? I don't think so. So it turns out all the characters here are part of a synergist startup. And I'm not going to admit that I'm losing the thread here. But yeah, I'm kind of losing the thread. And I'm anticipating my co-host is going to go Dan explain it to me. <laughs> it sounds like this is some kind of hustle being perpetrated by White Rabbit and Kareem, remember him? Where instead of selling Sinister Six tech and giving the money to Tombstone, they're going to rent it out over and over and pocket the extra revenue. Did I get that right, Dan? Yeah, that's actually right. 
Okay, cool. All right. So anyway, it all seems right with the world, except for the fact that Spidey and Felicia are obviously going to put a stop to all this, except the fake Mysterio ends up with an umbrella in the fishbowl, and suddenly the Sinister Six has betrayed White Rabbit and Kareem, and we have an unlikely team-up headed into the next issue. Great. That was an awesome recap, Mark. Uh, a lot of references there that I still don't get, but I'm, I'm happy to leave them <laughs> where they are, uh, you know, in, in Gen X territory. Um, there we Mark, go. you mentioned this recap page, but you didn't really get into it. And like, it's very rare. You see a recap page, light the internet on fire. And, uh, you know, uh, personally, I thought this recap page was like, mostly great you know it, it is taking a snarky tone about the book that like i don't know if it's responding to internet criticism per se um but you know it, it's acknowledging look like if you have problems with spider-man teaming up with norman our book has gone out of the way to address it but here we are one more time telling you you need we're not treating this like it's a normal thing like, like right. we are going to make jokes about it. So like as upset as you are, like we are, um, you know, making a joke about it. Now, the, like on the Internet, I said this is them having a gas and people got really upset with me like, hey, it's good. They're having fun, but I'm not having fun. And it's like, OK, yes, that's your preference. You may not enjoy this, but they're not treating this like we like we're supposed to be 100 percent accepting that Peter working with Norman is a normal thing. Um, and right. so like, I appreciated that in the recap, right? They know that they are doing this with an, an, an eye to making you question, why would Peter do this? Right. But then yeah. the real thing that, that set people on fire is the reveal that MJ and Paul are married, um, you know, in a recap page. And I have a lot of questions about this. Mark, you made reference to it. Tell us your reaction to this. I I mean, yeah, the, the 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 cheekiness of the tone, I I that didn't bother me, as you noted. I mean, I kind of feel like they're having fun. I mean, you know, we 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 obviously have talked ad nauseum about kind of the onlineness of some Spider-Man fans and their reactions to it. But yeah, I I I I do feel using the word marriage to describe Paul and MJ in the recap page when that has not been clearly established. To, from my vantage in the text is a, is a bit of a Bush League move. So, you know, like, and if that's just some subterfuge, then double shame because now we're creating more confusion and it just makes me want to just get to what did Peter do, like, as soon as possible. And I know they are, but, like, this, they better pay this off soon because now we're getting into territory where if you're going to, like, troll and misdirect in a recap page about this like to me like that's unfair that's unfair uh storytelling so um let's just see what happens i'm not going to spend too much time on this i don't want to speculate about it dan i know you're probably yeah. gonna want to speculate about it uh or maybe not i don't know but like to me it's like tone is fine but like revealing major plot points about a mystery angle that you've been teasing from the beginning makes me get uneasy about where this mystery is headed so there you go I have to tell you, Mark, I don't want to speculate about like what it means, but like there, there is a part of me, like you, you read these recaps and they clearly seem like they were written by an intern at midnight right. b before print. Like the language is terrible as available. Alan Shurstall would say like they need a copy editor on these pages. And this is a great right. example. Like it, like if you read the language of this, you can understand it, but it is like presented in the most confusing fashion about who they're talking about, which girlfriend, who's dating who. It, it's not yeah. a very clearly written recap page. S sentence, sentence structure is not their passion here. That's, no, that's, that's and so day. like, <laughs> it, it makes me want to lump the reveal of this marriage in, into that, like whether or not like they intended, they realized they were revealing that here. I even went, um, you know, some people who might have picked this up, I picked up this book and Mark, I sent you a copy, the Spider-Man script to page book. Um, that mm -hmm. came out recently that has it, the first, uh, you know, it number one script in it where we're introduced to MJ and Paul. And I even went in there to read there if like in Zeb Wells script for um, that issue, it's revealed that they're married alongside with having kids. And there's no reference to that in there. Um, and I looked back through all the appearances of Paul to see if like maybe we had missed some detail 
But no, MJ is never wearing a wedding ring. Paul is never wearing a wedding ring. You could say perhaps as a couple, they're beyond that. There is a moment in the Mary Jane and Black Cat comic from Dark Web where Mary Jane makes reference to her jewelry coming to life and attacking her. Um, But Mm. she's grabbing her wrist, not her ring finger. So, like, I can't imagine it's the ring that came to life and attacked her. So, you know, if we were supposed to pick up it through, like, through a clue like that, it's not there on the pages. There's in, in the first dark web issue, uh, you know, uh, the, the dawn, or I guess the, it was the rather the dusk, like MJ refers to Paul as her beau, um, which is not really something you would call your husband, um, maybe your boyfriend. So for me, I wonder if like this was just a mistake on the recap page or, but, but I don't really know either way. It's really weird and sloppy. And I messaged Nick Lowe about it because he apparently follows me on Twitter, and and he you know maybe will respond. I doubt it, but um, it is another kind of sloppy. Either we're all really daft, and we were meant to assume that because they have kids, which the nature of which has not been established yet. Um, right. You know, so it's another one of those ambiguous things that maybe shouldn't have been revealed in the manner that it was revealed. All, all I will say, and and you know, then I beg if we can just move into the issue itself, is that the longer they, you know, you mentioned messaging Nick Lowe, but I feel like the longer they go without publicly addressing this in any kind of meaningful way, to me, makes me think, even if it was a mistake, they're happy with the mistake, and that kind of irritates me even more. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so, so that's all I got to say about that. Um, I, I, and I think, I think if they admitted it was a mistake, they would get more like credit for admitting it was a mistake than just like sticking with it. You know, um, right, like right. I think we could all kind of go, oh, wait, like they are months ahead of us in the scheduling pipeline. They got a little bit of their fingers crossed, like whatever mistakes happen. Like, would I like, do I like that mistakes happen? No, but we're all human, you know? Right. Um, Anyway, what do you think of this issue overall? I mean, look, I'm I'm not going to pretend that this is like a masterclass of, of Spider-Man comics here, but like, to me, like if, if you, if you need to get Zeb Wells and John Romita Jr. up, up to schedule and, 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 you know, they need to take a, a, a brief, period off i mean yeah we could talk about the double shipping of this book and the 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 problems that come from that uh separately at some point but like to me this is how you do it like 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 this was a completely um harmless fun fill-in issue that you know feels familiar and feels like it's driving the narrative forward and but um you know recap recap reveals aside um it's 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 a superficial drive forward so like you know it's you're not totally stand at a standstill but like you feel like you're going somewhere so i was i was fine with it from a from a total from a tone standpoint and just um from uh from a structure standpoint yeah i think that i agree i think this was a great kind of tonal refresh issue um, i mean like and and like way to do it on a vacation you know like like it's literally let's take a vacation and You know, I couldn't have asked her anything more than that right now. Like, like after dark web, I need a vacation. And, uh, (laughs) you know, this, this felt like the, the right way to do it. Um, and, and this book remind this, this issue. And I imagine the next issue, like remind me of brand new day in all the like good and bad ways, uh, you know, of brand new day, which is say like, we are very vocally, you know, supportive of brand new day on, on, on this show. Um, like and 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 the positives of that being, you know, this felt like not an inventory story, but like part of a calculated decision, right? This ties up threads that had been seeded all the way back to the start of Zeb's run, you know. So this is like an editorial team and writing team sharing resources to like make this feel like a cohesive world. It's a two-parter that focuses on character and supporting cast over spectacle. Right. Like the villain is maybe a little forgettable, but the character stuff is fun, enjoyable and takes advantage of what makes Spider-Man comics unique, which is the focus on supporting cast and everyday hijinks and antics of being a person, Um, Mm. you know, on, on the on the negative side of this. Like, I mean, I enjoyed some of the sex jokes here, 
but like it, it definitely took me back to the early two thousands where like they were much more comfortable making kind of like icky sex jokes in, in, in a Spider-Man comic, uh, which you referenced in your like Mark Wade watching Aunt May in bed with Jonah senior stuff. Um, yeah, I just feel I, like I, we I haven't mean, was... gotten those jokes recently. Brand new day was like kind of full of that kind of stuff. It's it's not even the sex jokes as much as like I mean you know as my my Gen X references might have gone over your head I mean like it this this felt very sitcommy to me which yeah. is a lot which you could say the same about Brand New Day, uh, in in parts you know and that's yeah. that's fine um, in small doses but like I don't I you know like I would have a hard time having this kind of like you know rapid succession punchline awkward situations awkward romantic situations uh you know going off if this was like a, an every an every issue thing so you know it's it's a bit of a it's a it's a different kind of silliness from what we got with dark web so it still feels like a palate cleanser in its own weird way yeah <laughs> um but but it's still like this is not necessarily a tone or a style of storytelling that I feel works over the long haul for Spider-Man. So, you know, but that's, that's Joe Kelly. I, you know what I mean? Like, like this is what, this is, you know, he's, he's the godfather of Deadpool. So, you know what I mean? Like, it's, uh, so that's, you get what you get there. Yeah. And, and that's to say, like, and you said this earlier, I thought this, this is like a fairly forgettable story. Um, but like, that's not a knock against it. You know, like, like this is exactly, I think what maybe this book needed at the time, but you know, talking about Joe Kelly and Zeb and 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 like the Dodsons, you know, having this feel like brand new day, you know, a brand new day or a book, it it really made me think about like it's amazing that what fifteen years out from br- brand new day, how much that era still remains the defining force behind this comic, you know, yeah. like we're still pulling from that roster that was assembled fifteen years ago for talent um, uh, on this book. And that's not to say we haven't had new voices, you know, and uh, you know, you and I are very praiseworthy of JRJR who was kind of a part of the brand new day ro- right. roster briefly. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't define him that way um, no. at all, but uh, you know, it, it is, there's a sort of um, nostalgia to this issue um, that like couldn't help but hit me. And um, I don't know if that's just like showing my own age and my preference is like, I love, I love these kind of stories um, over the kind of like uh, stories that I would say tend to like just randomly reinvent the character or try to come up with the next big hook. This felt like mm. uh, more classic comics territory of what I expect from a Spider-Man comic, which is, I think what we've praised on the issues we really liked from Wells run and in that regard, it feels like it fits in uh, to this run uh, pretty solidly. Yeah, no, I, 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 I don't disagree with with any of that at all. So, what did you think specifically about Terry Dodson and, and and the Dodson's art in general? The return. I mean, like, I know I made my my cheesecake jokes, and oh, I, there wasn't anything I think too over the top here on a visual standpoint. Um, but like, it, it is hard for me to like see Terry Dodson art and not you know think about you know the black cat miniseries with kevin smith and you know the mark millar series with you know marvel knights and uh it's 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 weird for me like i because i i don't like it's good it's good clean art but like i don't know like i i always think back to like some of like the over the top cheesecakey stuff he does and like i'm always just kind of like leery turning the pages like when is he gonna bust something out and he hasn't yet i don't feel on this yeah, there's no moment where uh, Black Cat's zipper is like precariously low in in, in a right. way that like those other books might. This felt you know fairly restrained uh, for for Dodson's the, the Dodson's art, which I think is you know very male gazy. Um, you know, even amongst like superhero comics, big two superhero comics, which tend to be fairly male gaze uh, heavy. Um, I actually thought like, uh, you know, like avoiding that and the kind of icky stuff that I tend to like bristle at from the Dodson's art 
Like I thought the character profiles and splashes of Peter and Felicia were really strong here. Just like fun, flirty stuff and like handsome renderings of these characters. It is definitely like cheesecakey and everybody's like too handsome and beautiful by like a, like several steps, you know? Mm. But um uh, like th- th- it was fun. You know, like there's the great uh, you know image of them having coffee together while they're out in their costumes and the steam is coming off of their like bodies that are with their costumes are torn just in all the right places, you know, to emphasize their physique. And like it never felt overly sexualized, but it was also just like kind of handsome, fun portraits of like for for like this kind of dating sitcom issue. Uh, so. I thought that stuff was great. It it only really fell apart for me in the later half of the issue when we yes. bring in all of these characters and you get these sketchy crowd scenes that like one, I think really severely impact the narrative and two really felt like layouts. Like, like did he just not finish this artwork um, or yeah. did they just not finish this artwork? So um, that was really weird to me. Like I had to reread several things to like really understand who was talking where, and that gets to what, to the narrative point, which I think we'll talk about later in this episode is the narrative begin to fall apart, fall apart for me in the later half, because I was maybe doing the extra work and it got like that much more complicated narratively. And that collision of art and writing being less uh, solid really took me out of the story in the latter half. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll withhold my full criticism until we get to like the actual impacts in the story uh part of our conversation in a bit but yeah i mean like i refer to it in my my recap like this this comic became very hard for me to follow um and the and the visuals kind of set that off like yeah this the the, like basically everything from when they left the spa like became hard for me to follow um i agree and and you know like yeah, that was that was frustrating. It kind of felt like an incomplete comic to me in that regard. So, um, any other any other thoughts on? Well, uh, what did what did you think of the cover? Because I know like you kind of commented on this t- on Twitter uh, a few days ago too that you really liked the cover, but there's a but. Yeah, no, I think this is a really cool cover. I mean, obviously they don't fight ninjas in this issue or the the hand, <laughs> you know, and so we could ding it that way. I imagine what happened is they gave you know this story outline to JRJR a while back and instead of fighting the Scorchers gang in the in the first opening pages they were fighting ninjas and I don't know if you're reading Daredevil or Punisher where like there's a big like the hand versus the fist war going on right now mm-hmm. really great comics by the way um uh I imagine like maybe the hand was in the layout and the editors told them you can't use the hand or the fist right now because they're engaged in something else and it became the Scorcher gang, um, and which is a cool callback to like untold tales and, uh, and stuff like that. But, um, so the cover doesn't really match the interior. I'm okay. Cause I think this is one of the coolest looking covers ever. Um, but then they do this worst date ever joke and I love covers with balloons on them, but like they repeat right. the same joke twice on the cover. Could you right. not have come up with any other joke? Like, um, you got, you got like, I mean, of all people, you got Joe Kelly, like, you know, who, and Zeb Wells, who are both very funny writers. They couldn't punch that up for you a little bit or come up with anything else. Just choose one. Yeah. I, I know the nitpick, but like you got this great cover, you know, l- leave it alone. Yeah. Anyway, 100%. That's my, that's right, my well, soapbox, Mark. Well, I'm sure you got it on the soapbox in the Slack too. Should I tell people about the Slack here? Absolutely. Well, hundreds of listeners like you hang out in our community of Spider-Man fans on Slack. The amazing Spider Slack community is absolutely free to join, and you can jump into active conversations with awesome people about collecting, conventions, movies, new comics, old comics, and more. Dan, um, you know, what's going on in the Slack this week besides, you know, people probably making fun of the fact that I like to read the ad for the Slack, even though I'm rarely there. And they do. They do like to make fun of you about that. Uh, yes. Mark, this week in the Slack, our video editor, Alex Golucky, put together all the covers from Dark Web and laid them out so that their back, back, backgrounds form a giant web. And the crazy thing about this is, like, the art teams who designed these covers went through all this work to create this, like, awesome layout where all the backgrounds of webs line up to form this giant, you know, like, poster, uh, like, of this web. 
and I've not seen this advertised anywhere. Like you'd think the like editorial <laughs> team would want to show off all that hard work or like use it to promote dark web in some way, or maybe they're holding it off for the trade. But Alex like took painstakingly like, you know, his work to assemble this thing and shared it on the Slack. And it kind of blew everybody's minds because it seemed like this, you know, in, you know, these weird background designs, but he actually discovered that they all line up. So that was cool to, for him to share there. And it just speaks to how passionate our Slack is about doing fun Spider-Man things, even in an era of, you know, dark web where people aren't super digging that, that event. Um, he created this cool, like, you know, assembly out of it. So if that's something that might interest you or anything like that, come join our Slack. It's a really fun place to hang out with great Spider-Man fans. And, uh, there's a link in the description of this episode that'll let you get in there and sign up for less than a minute. Come in, say hello, announce yourself, let us know who you are. We'll be well, we will happy to welcome you to our Slack family. All right, that sounds awesome, Dan. So why don't why don't we get back into the review here? Um, so again, I, I I said this earlier. Very uh, a lot of sitcommy premises here regarding romantic hijinks. Here, what did it work for you? Well, this is the half of the episode where I think we talk about um, narrative confusion um, and the mm. things that like, despite like having good setups aren't a hundred like operating at a hundred percent. And I, I, I thought that the setup that like Mary Jane and Paul end up at the same resort as, uh, as Felicia and Peter, because they use the same digital coupon to get the hotel. Great all time setup, you know, like uh, of like a good romantic comedy, you know, like gone wrong kind of thing. I think it's a great like idea and, and the kind of thing, that, you know, back in the era of Groupon, which I think is kind of past now. You you would have people like texting. I don't know about your friends, Mark, but we would text each other like, "Did you see this Groupon? We should all get in on this together." You know. Um, uh, I mean, this was also an episode of Frasier. I mean, you know, now yeah. I'm really dating myself, but you know, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. I mean, look, it, it's not it's not brand new territory, but like a great setup here. But on the counter to this, and I, Mark, I I can already hear you saying this too. Is like, uh, but for me, this is the first time that I felt the MJ Paul stuff actively hurt the t this title. Um, like, I think it's long, and, and we talked about it, it's been like a B C plot of this book, and not right. the focus of the book. And would I have loved this thing to wrap up before whatever twenty the twenty first issue where they're going to start wrapping this up? Yeah, yeah, uh, and and I've yet to see like. You know, once that resolves, we can talk about whether it was good to execute it that way. But reading this issue where that kind of got elevated to an A plot level, I found the ambiguity of all of this to really impact the jokes and the drama. Like, I, I just, there's so much like Peter was stalking them, but wasn't he? Or what does Peter know about the MJ Paul thing? What have they shared? Like, all of that stuff, like, gets in the way for me, like, uh, like uh, enjoying what seemed to be like fairly well executed jokes from the writing team. Right. Well, this is, you know, as I said months ago, this is the drawback of, of leading, leading your arc with the mystery box, because now it's like, we have to, we have to talk in, in the code and, and, and mystery, you know, language here, because we can't just say what, what is actually happening here. And then, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's, it's frustrating to read through this as, you know, as, you know, in our position, because we, you know, we don't, we don't have all the cards and, you know, they have all the cards, meaning, you know, the creators, which, you know, bully for them, but like, that doesn't make it an enjoyable reading experience because it's just like, like you said, like, what, what what is the actual drama here? What is the actual tension? What's the actual truth? You know what I mean? Like we don't know. Um, so I I don't find entertainment in trying to parse this this you know code filled dialogue. So you know like get get let's just get to what Peter did now. Like like I I, I can't deal with too many issues of this kind of stuff because it didn't work in my opinion. And that's the thing, like, we, like we're about to get the conclusion of this, right? Like, unless they right. pull a kindred on us, but they've really right. been telling us, you know, we're going to wrap this up in 21 through, you know, 26, right? And that's right. right around the corner, you know, 
but then it seems weird to kind of like actively elevate it right before um, that story. Although at the same time, I guess you want to refresh people like what they want to have a resolution to. Um, it's just weird. Like, and, and even just thinking back on this run where Peter called MJ in like the first issue and she hid in the closet. So Paul wouldn't know that they were talking to each other. And since then we've had like her and Peter talking at the coffee shop, you know, and kind of reopening that relationship and here, like Paul still remains kind of a non-entity. Like he's kind of there um, with his facial hair and all. And uh, he seems kind of okay to spend time with them, even though the implication is that Peter seems to have been stalking his, his wife now. It's just right. weird. And I don't know if I'm supposed to like think it's weird or, or, or what. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm eager for this to resolve and I'm not impatient because I know it's coming, you know, but it, yeah. it's worth acknowledging that like this book is damaged by it, I think. Yeah. Now, what did you think of the Peter Felicia dynamic in this? I mean, like, I, I, I mean, there was some fun stuff here, but again, more ambiguity about what is actually going on here. Right. Well, it's weird because like the implication from the very beginning is that they're dating. But then when directly questioned on it and maybe I'm not understanding the tone of this. Like right. uh, Peter says, like, yes, I think we're dating. And then she seems to imply, no, it's purely platonic. I couldn't tell right. if she was joking or if like that was serious. Um, you know, I, I it seemed to be a joke, but like it seems like it's like a fling of some sort. But that didn't seem to be the way it was approached by Wells. Like Peter seemed pretty sincere in asking black hat out even if we thought like that was out of nowhere and so this whole thing with her seems really ambiguous too like how invested are we supposed to be in this and i'll tell you i'm not like i uh, like i if they want to date fine but like the the scene of her bringing up mj and peter's lingering feelings for her is not like a nice adult characterization for felicia but like is weird. Like if she knows that, why is she allowing herself to play second fiddle to MJ? That just doesn't seem in character for someone like Felicia. Um, right. So, I mean, unless they're going to progress the character, which in that case, I'm actually for that, but like, let's, uh, yeah, it seems odd to me to have that characterization. If we're then going to turn around to like the, the, the no commitment, you know, free footloose and fancy free Felicia again in an issue, which, you know, I, I think it's fully possible. I mean, you know, it could go either way, you know yeah, what I mean? In yeah. terms of how we want to portray Felicia in this, in this series. It's also tough, like reading, um, like Jed McKay's black cat books where like he has really taken that character and not reinvented her, but like really elevated her and made her like worthy of having her own title. Like, I mean, I think that's the most, like one of the most fun books coming out. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, he had her dating like women and like really opening up the, uh, you know, this character about how she approaches relationships and then to have like uh, her dating Peter and have that acknowledged in the new black cat or MJ and black cat issues where she's like, ooh, well, like how will MJ feel about me going out with Peter felt like a weird regression that was forced on Jed McKay. And so it's like yeah. it's kind of a bummer because like I think Jed should be allowed to be allowed to run with this character because he's writing the best version of her. I know mm -hmm. the pecking order is ASM then black cat, you know, but uh, I, I don't know. It's a shame just because that book is so good that mm -hmm. like for at least for black cat, I think her book should get to dictate how she's characterized. And it's like, I don't know. It, it feels like having your cake and eating it too with this depiction here. I, I, it's just weird. It's nebulous. And I, I, I think I want the Mary Jane thing to resolve before I really can get invested in in something else. Um, yeah. So. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. 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 Um, now, uh, let's just also make the perfunctory reference that Aunt May told a joke about a condom, which it's just like, all right, we're good. <laughs> 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 Say no more. Say no uh, more. Uh, but 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 that that page but, of my comic might have vomit stains on it. But uh, there, there you yeah, go. Fair there enough. you go. 
Uh, but let's, you know, we alluded to this earlier, like the, 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 like the post spa section of this comic with the villains, like this was this, this kind of made the comic a bit of a mess for me. Um, like, like I said, it was, the action was hard to follow visually and it was hard to follow narratively. You know, I'm glad that we were at a similar understanding about what the white rabbits plot was, but that doesn't mean this was enjoyable to read in any kind of way because of how confusing it was both visually and, and, and narratively. I can tell you the exact moment where I went, wait, what? Uh, uh, yeah. Is there like he, enc- they encounter them outside and there's like the earthquakes happening. And then it like in, in comics parlance cuts or turns the page and they're together like indoors at like a bar, like having yeah. like food with them. And it was like, a really bizarre transition and like looking back on it, I'm like, Oh, okay. Like he can't just run in there and beat people up and arrest them. Cause they're not breaking a crime or they're not breaking a law. Right. It's like yeah. running into a comic book convention and busting up cosplayers, you know, right. like, uh, and he acknowledges as such. And like, in many ways it's a continued upholding of his deal with tombstone, which is like, we'll kind of stay out of each other's business and like, Uh, You know, and I'm going to keep an eye on you. And that's kind of what Spidey's doing here. And he says, like, the minute you break a law, I'm going to step in. But for now, like, I can't bust you up for this. But that transition of, like, now we're just going to chill with White Rabbit, who, like, historically is a villain. Like, I I, I, I had to kind of, like, reorient my, you know, uh, perspective on this. And maybe the comic didn't get me there um, with that. I, I don't know. Was that the moment for you? Am I... Am I alone? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, like, and like, and then like the whole like there was like this whole riff of dialogue where it was like, oh, we're definitely not like B actors or something. I'm like, wait, so are they? Uh, what what is happening here? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, you know, like you got to tell me, like, you, like you can't you can't be ambiguous about something like the, like the main hero villain conflict of the comic. You know what I mean? And then like it was like, okay. The, the Mysterio ends up getting, you know, an umbrella to the head and, you know, the villains are confronting White Rabbit, Kareem and Spidey and Felicia. I'm like, OK, here we go. Like, this is now now I think I get what's happening here. Like, here's the double cross. But like, no, this is this was really this felt underbaked and underdeveloped. And, you know, part of me, even with a fill in team, makes me wonder if you know, there were deadline issues and things were rushed out because it just felt very under underbaked to me. Well, I mean, like I said, and reflected in the art, like, like it goes on like, to, like some like, like, like feel like layouts rather than yeah. like fully finished artwork. Um, that being said though, I like, and I mentioned this earlier when talking about bringing in a fill in team, like I loved that a bunch of the subplots came to a close here, you know, like mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. I thought for sure that white rabbit selling, all of the different costumes was something that was going to resolve itself in the hobgoblin arc, given that like hobgoblin had, you know, moved on to kind of selling costumes to people to basically take up the roles of these D listers. Um, And when that didn't happen, I thought, Oh, it was like, was that an abandoned plot? But it comes back here and Kareem returns like fan favorite Kareem. Um, (laughs) And uh, that made me smile. Like it made me feel like, Oh, like, like especially for something that was t- almost 20 issues ago um you know that these subplots are going somewhere you know and they they're not something we have to like wink wink nudge nudge at all the time like oh okay your your attention to detail will pay off and, and you know and if you didn't notice it it still pays off you know uh so like that to me at least suggests like okay like there's some care being paid to and uh, and being passed on to Joe Kelly from Zeb Wells, you know, sometimes these fill in artists feel like they're writing books like completely out of nowhere. Um, and right. this felt like, oh, no, he's actually a picking up what Zeb is putting down. And mm-hmm. um, I, I think that's wor- worth like commending it, 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 you know, in a, at least a little bit of a way. Yeah. OK, well, do you want to you want to give this a grade? Yeah, I'm giving this one a B minus. Okay, I, I I'm just a, a shade underneath you. I'm giving it a C plus. I mean, and and I got to be honest, like a part of me, especially with the way the second half resolved, like, was tempted to go and not even go into C territory. But yeah. like it was, it was fun, it was fun. 
um, and I enjoyed it as a whole as an experience. I just like, you know, so maybe it's a bit of a curve from post dark web, but um, <laughs> you know, like. It, it, this is this was harmless comic book storytelling. I'll fully acknowledge that my grade is is based on uh, a reaction to Dark Web and a like, hey, do more of this Spider Office. Like, if you if you got to give yourself people time, your team time to keep it consistent, bring in bring in some good writers that can do a fun story like this. Not everything needs to be uh, this book will traumatize you. Sometimes right. things can be a little vacation and I'm okay with that. Uh, yes. Like, like that, that's part of what makes Spider-Man comics fun is their ability to kind of, you know, do many different things. And um, with, within a, like within some constraints, like I would say dark web is not one of those, but anyway, <laughs> we won't want to relive that conversation. Um, so again, B minus probably more likely a C, but I I'm feeling generous today. So, um, well, what's not generous though, Dan, is is the fact that we've hit that time of the of the show where, unfortunately, all good things have to come to an end. So, um, we do want to be generous by saying thank you to you, the listeners and viewers, for tuning into this episode of the Amazing Spider Talk. Yeah, and a thank you to everyone who supports us on Patreon. This podcast exists because of that listener support on Patreon. So for only $3.99 a month, you can help support our show's existence while getting early episodes, including these reviews the same weeks the comics release, exclusive artwork, and a ton of other bonuses. So again, another thank you to everyone who already supports us and the work that Mark and I do every week. To download our earliest episodes, including interviews with legendary creators like J.M. DeMatteis, Tom DeFalco, Ron Friends, Mark Bagley, and more... Subscribe to our amazing Spider Talk Back Issues podcast on Apple Podcasts. This podcast was edited by Rick Coast. Our video version of the show is available on YouTube and was edited by Alex Galucky. Our artwork comes handcrafted by artists Ron Friends, Sal Buscema, and Ray Sumzer. Our theme songs were produced by Rylan Bojack, Tony Thaxton, and Spider Madge. And our animated intro was created and performed by Josh Sutton. So, Mark. Until you and I both use the same Groupon and find ourselves on a vacation with our wives together, fighting over Canadian bagels and bacon at the complimentary intercontinental breakfast, what's our motto? With great podcasts, there must also come the amazing spider talk. Get your hands off my Canadian bagel. Bonjour. No. <laughs> <laughs>